It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker this morning, Professor Ronald Goifman. His title is not uh, about subsets of strange square to the power n, but rn. I mean, uh, he is a, a, a giant in uh, theoretical harmonic analysis uh, 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 in rn, but he's also uh, well known by many people who know about applications of all this wonderful harmonic analysis in very real life and very large applications. So, uh, Professor Kaufman uh, did his PhD at the University of Geneva. He has uh, uh, been at Yale for many years now and uh, formed a whole slew of wonderful uh, uh, next generations of students. He's a member of the National Academy of Science. He got the National uh, uh, Medal of Science from uh, the, the US government. And I'm not going to steal any more of his time. And uh, welcome Professor Koifman to the stage. Thank you, Ingrid. It's a real pleasure to be here and to try to tell you a story, at least a story going from the past to the present, in which you will see the continuity uh, of sort of analytical progress in understanding complicated structures. So my goal today is to describe a sort of evolution of harmonic analysis uh, from its inception. By the way, I see that the PowerPoint refuses to have uh, R, the symbol R. I think it depends on the version. Uh, so this evolution is one in which, uh, in classical harmonic analysis, we were studying uh, complicated operators, which uh, was studied by methods of Fourier and methods of organization of domain and image of the operator. That's what I'm going to get into. And those tools nowadays uh, extended to higher order tensors and operators, in fact, allow you to organize very complex systems and get to the point that you can sort of extend what I would say you would call a Newtonian calculus to a setting uh, which is discrete or maybe approximating a continuous uh, setting by having a sequence of discretizations. And in a way that does not require calculus, but allows you to do exactly what calculus is doing. Now, you know, calculus, the way Newton and Leibniz were viewing it was a, a integration of local linear constraints on some physical uh, phenomenon, which is usually used to be mechanical phenomena. And once you encapsulated the local physical constraints, you try to develop method to understand globally uh, what is happening. So I would like to tell you how this story sort of evolves and what I think the future of it is going to be. So my goal is to reach the future. So let's start with the past. As you, you know that uh, today, I mean this year is 250 years since the birth of Fourier. And about 200 years ago, uh, maybe a little, a little more, a little less, he wrote his book on the analytic theory of heat. And this, this little text in French which I extracted out of the book basically could have been written today. Uh, what he says is the usual way of integrating equations uh, as Newton and other people after him were doing are just not sufficient if the phenomena you want to describe like heat propagation or solving the heat equation uh, need to be described. You have to have a new language to do it. And the new language, of course, is uh, the Fourier series, but he, he really went beyond sign series. Actually, the book, book is absolutely wonderful you know, uh, 200 years ago. And the language, if you, I did not translate, but I, uh, 
on purpose, I would like you to go and look into the book. It's fantastic. Now, a little bit later, Berard and Besson and Gallo observed that, again, staying with the theme of heat propagation, observed that you could use, if you wanted to relate one Riemannian manifold to another, you could do it by uh, what now I call diffusion embedding. What you could do is basically associate to each point in the manifold, say, the kernel, which is a heat kernel, which describes propagation at given different times. And so you associate to the point this function, which is the probability of reaching a neighboring point in uh, time t, so that's a kernel. And they observed that if you measure uh, the, that kernel, as is well known, encapsulates all the invariants and the geometry, uh, at least the infinitesimal, as well as the global geometry of, of the Riemannian manifold, say for a compact manifold. Uh, I'm referring to uh, Atia and Singer, their theory, and then Seeley's book on on that, but uh, what they observed is that if you wanted to relate different structure to each other, not just the Riemannian manifold to itself, you look at the heat kernel as giving you a compact embedding of the manifold into Hilbert space, and then you measure the distance between those embeddings as a way of measuring the distance between Riemann embedded Riemannian manifold in Hilbert space, right? And you can take the Hausdorff distance there, and they show that this is essentially uh, equivalent to the uh, Gromov distance between, between manifolds, except it's much easier. So this is a uh, hundred years later, and not knowing that, and, and, uh, some time ago uh, we actually used it to, to, to organize data, organize clouds of points in RN. In general, so what they, from this, from what I said now, this little introduction, it's clear that a way of studying geometry is to look at functions on that geometry and from the function learn about the geometry of the underlying object. Uh, another situation which I'm very fond of, this is work we were doing with Meyer about 20 or 30 years ago, was to understand something which seemingly is very simple. You have a, a curve in the plane and you want to understand sort of how do curves vary, okay? And what is a good geometry to impose on curves that allows you to match one curve to the other? It's sort of in the same spirit as the story described by uh, the, the Gromov uh, matching between Riemannian and Manifold, except uh, the object we were looking at were sort of rough. I mean, rough in the sense that they maybe had a uh, curve that's only rectifiable and nothing more. So here, uh, we were doing the following thing. We took uh, a curve, so as, as in, the, in the display here, and let's assume it's uh, parametrized, rectifiable. It's uh, parametrized by arc lengths. Uh, you can define a domain uh, and it sp splits the plane into two, uh, two simply connected components. And you, you define a domain, say, on the left of the curve, which is the way I have it, uh, the red domain over there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, here. So basically, a point zeta is on the curve, z is some point inside. You can look at the properties of this particular operator, which maps a function on the curve to some sort of uh, holomorphic function up here. And if you want to go, you can view the function. You can let z goes back to the limit. And it maps function on the curve to function on the curve. But I rather want to see it this way. So, uh, so in other words, on the curve, we have a family of functions, which, which is a function for every point. You have the f I mean, you have the f for every z, you have a function on the curve, which is 1 over zeta minus z. z is out here. And so the issue is, uh, and we found out, this was basically no, we didn't force it or anything. It was a natural uh, occurrence. So we found out that looking at this, the problems we were interested by, which is, so one of the problems was, oh, sorry. 
one of the problems was to, you see this little, you have this curve here. Uh, let's think of the curve as, in this case as being a, the riverbed. So this is a river here. And this is the riverbed. You want to know what the flow lines of liquid flowing over the bed is. All you need to do is consider the Riemann mapping from the lower half space here to the region above the curve. And the, the horizontal line becomes those flow lines. The problem we were concerned with is, is what happens if I add a little red bump here uh, to the curve? And when you do that, how, how, is, how are the flow lines going to change? So this is one of the most natural problems in, in analysis. Riemann introduces Riemann mapping. The question is, is a Riemann mapping continuous in the, in the boundary of the domain, which is, could be a parameterized curve in this case? Is it differentiable in that boundary? And in fact, what kind of functional is it, right? It maps a curve to, a, to some change of variable from arc lengths to some point to, to, function, to values on the line. And in what way is this, uh, this is actually nice? So it turns out that it's really not, well, it, it is quite difficult, but the, the result was quite surprising. So the first question is, how do I measure the, the distance between the, the curve with a bump and the curve without the bump? And in fact, uh, what is the size of that difference? So the way it, it came out is this. We looked at the, the operator here, which is a Cauchy operator. And we said, to every curve, there is such an operator. View it as, a, as an operator from the curve into itself. Let's pretend for a moment it's bounded on L2 of the curve relative to arc lengths. Then I can compare two curves by comparing the size of the operator attached to it. And as it turned out at the time when uh, Meyer and I discovered that, in fact, the distance between the operators is essentially some uh, distance between the argument of the curves when they are parameterized by arc lengths. In other words, the argument of the, of the usual thing. And the norm, so this distance is equivalent to what is called the norm of bounded mean oscillation, which basically measures a maximum local L2 variance of, the, of this function. So this norm was around, introduced by uh, John and Nirenberg years ago for PDE, but it pops out this way. So basically looking at this analytic question gives us a geometric insight about how to measure the distance between the curves and uh, was, was quite nice. It's very, it turns out that once you know that, it's, there's a very easy translation from the Cauchy transform to the, what is called the Zerga transform, which is really contained by the Riemann mapping. So you get the Riemann mapping. You get that the Riemann mapping, in fact, is analytic on the manifold of curves if the manifold of curves is parameterized in this uh, Banach space manifold structure, which is the BMO of the argument. And, it's a, and the space is defined as being, in effect, the largest space for which the Riemann mapping is differentiable or analytic for that matter. So that's, so, at, uh, so we, uh, this was quite nice, but I'm going to relate it to how you do that analysis and understand, try to figure out how the brain of a mouse works, okay? So it, it really goes way out. So, by the way, those, those results were uh, later extent, so this characterization of the kind of curves we were dealing with. By the way, the condition on BMO for small, uh, basically is equivalent for small, val for small norms to say that the curve <coughs> are verified the core dark condition, which means that the ratio of the length of the curve between two points and the length of the arc between those two points and, and the chord between the two chords is, is bounded. So it's completely geometric. There's nothing, no analysis, no nothing. It's just the curve doesn't pinch itself too much, and uh, it's, it's done under control. Those kind of results were extended later by uh, Peter Jones and uh, Guy David and Stephen Sems to basically subsets, uh, co-dimension one subsets uh, in Rn, and then more generally, and in fact, uh, this, this kind of condition uh, gives rise to a very detailed and deep theory on how to 
uh, organized sets in particular, if you want to answer the question, do I, ha I have a set of points, can I parameterize it by, say, a by Lipschitz map uh, in three variables, for example? And so there are direct numerical conditions to, to do that, which are uh, esti local estimates that you do. Uh, this also relates to the so-called traveling salesman problem, the way Peter Jones was doing it. You have a collection of points. You want to estimate the length of the shortest curve going through them without computing that curve, but just doing local estimates on variability from straight lines. In any case, I'm getting uh, to, to my story which is uh, what we have here. Uh, you see this small, so this is now, I'm sort of s jumping several steps ahead and we'll, we'll flip back and forth between them. So you see this molecule that is pointed out to here, the arrow points to it, is an alanine dipeptide molecule. It has 10 atoms. And what we were, we were doing is simulate, basically simulating knowing the energy of the molecule at any given configuration, you can basically stochastically simulate the molecule in water. So when it's in water, it's, it sort of vibrates and oscillates a lot. And so what you collect really uh, is a collection of configurations <coughs> in this dimension, so, uh, dimension 30 basically, because you have 10 atoms, three coordinates per each. Of, co of course, you should reduce the dimension uh, substantially, but what you see, uh, you don't expect this thing to be very complicated. The, the molecule, the atoms could be anywhere, but they're sort of basic places where it would be because the, the shape of the molecule is governed by those two uh, axes that you see that are pointed to. You see there are two angle variables, which basically tells you how, how it's shaped. And then, of course, it vibrates a lot from that. Once you, those angles are frozen, you may find many configurations like this. So think of it, there is a state of the molecule which is sitting in space with the two angles at a certain configuration. But our goal was not that. Our goal was, can we find those angles just from, from observations? And do we need to observe the full molecule to do it? So the point was, don't do that. Just let's try and do the following. Can we? say, observe only five of the, of the atoms, and then from that uh, get the, the coordinates, which are the, the position of the two angles in, in space, uh, from the five, and then take another set of five atoms, and can I get the same angles? And in fact, can I get a representation which is going to have to be nice enough to be sort of independent of the observation mode, okay? So it's like, uh, I mean, mathematicians have been always saying, well, I have a manifold, uh, say, surface in R3. I can write co local coordinates for the surface, but that depends on how I do it, right? Every time I turn the surface around, I get a def different set of coordinates if I want to, to do it by, say, projecting on some planes. So the issue is, is there a sort of an intrinsic way of assigning coordinates. And as you will see, not only there is one, but we should have used it for, <laughs> for years when dealing with Riemannian manifolds. And so here, the assumption, underlying assumption here, is that basically this is mostly a two-dimensional manifold, uh, basically given by the, the angles, that, those two angles in there. And we want to discover that manifold with its internal intrinsic metric uh, as, as it comes. And so what you see is we have observed the molecule with five atoms on the left. We have observed it with five atoms on the right. We found two latent, two basically what we call intrinsic coordinates, which is the x-axis and the y-axis, which are basically the eigenvectors of a diffusion operator or a probabilistic kernel, which I will explain in a few minutes. And you see the molecule with this observation or the other. The color, by the way, is, is represents the, the size of, say, one of the two angles. And as you can see, the color on, the, on both representations, it's pretty good. We actually measure the relevant variable quite nicely uh, from 
uh, from this set of observations. So it's remarkable. In other words, there is some sort of innate truth floating, floating in there, and we want to pull it out. We don't care what instrument we are using. We would like to have sort of a characterization of some latent variable or par parameters which describe intrinsically the changes of states of that molecule. What is really happening in this case is that we don't match a point to a point. What we do is we take, we observe the molecule for a little while, so we observe a little cloud of, of neighbor, a, a basically a neighborhood of a given position, because this is stochastic in water, and, and then we are comparing the, the statistics of that neighborhood to the statistics of a neighborhood of another point, and that's how we relate points to each other. Comparing statistics has the advantage that you are not pre-specifying how you are going to relate things to each other. Probability is probability is probability. It doesn't, if you can measure it, you have automatically an intrinsic way of seeing, uh, seeing the world. So let me uh, go back a little bit. So this is about 11 years ago. Uh, uh, we were working on this, trying to use the sort of diffusion processes uh, to organize data. And Amit Singer, who was working with me and who is going to give a talk this afternoon, uh, made the observation that if you want to solve a, an old problem, we were looking at uh, sort of problems related to cryo-EM, he probably will talk about it quite a bit more. And if you wanted to solve the problems uh, posed already by Cauchy, so you see, we are going back in antiquity, uh, which was how do you determine the shape of a body, uh, a rigid body, if you know for every point in it, say, so it's a discrete, a tinker toy, if you wish. It's a discrete body, and for every point, you know the distances of that point to a few of its neighbors and, and the assumption, underlying assumption, which is not obvious but can be checked, is that you have enough information to, define, to, to have the point uh, rigidly defined. Or for example, you think of it this way, you have the cities in the US and you know for each city uh, a few other cities in the neighborhood and you know the distance, exact distances between them can you assemble the map of the US? I mean, so the way, how, how would we do that? I mean, it's very simple. I mean, you take a point and you look at, say, the three or four or five neighbors. So if you have enough neighbors uh, to determine, to do basically uh, trigonometry to determine all the angles, uh, then you can easily write every city, as, as is here, as a convex combination of a few of its neighbors. Okay. And so that, that, would be, that would be your model. And once you've done that, you can, okay, so that's, that's a local linear model, if you wish, of how the cities relate to each other. So for every city, you compare it to a few neighbors, and you describe the city as a convex combination of its, of its neighbor. So suppose, I'm, uh, so suppose you have done that, then the solution of the problem is staring at you. It's right sitting there. And that's, that was a genius of Amit Singer. He saw the obvious, which, uh, by the way, escaped a lot of people. People had been at the time actually looking uh, at this thing, uh, looking at this thing and using supercomputers to compute uh, the map and so on, okay? And you can do it in a minute on your laptop, in a second on your laptop. So the, if you read the equation, it says that the, basically uh, the points have to be essentially fixed points of this matrix apply to them. Or if you wish, the x-coordinates of a point has to be an eigenvector of this matrix. The y-coordinate of this point has to be an eigenvector of that matrix. And the vector whose constant entries are 1 is also an eigenvector of this matrix viewed on, on the space Rn, where n is the total number of points that you have. Right? So for every point, you have a few neighbors. You have a million points, you have uh, you can take, I don't know, five neighbor, neighbors per point, that would be good. And so the eigenvectors automatically give you, uh, and so now you, now you want to get the actual map. It's obvious, right? Uh, you compute the, two, the first three eigenvectors of this matrix, corresponding to eigenvalue one. Assume that's all there is, which is sort of implies some rigidity. 
And then from that, you just have to basically write. Uh, so x is a linear combination of the two eigenvectors you, you found. y is a linear combination of the two eigenvectors that you find. Uh, if you set 0 to be, uh, uh, to be the, the, center, center of, the center of all the points, so the average of, of the points that you have is 0, then 1 is orthogonal to that. So you need those two eigenvectors. Uh, they are orthogonal to 1. And, and now you, all you have to do is find two parameters, but then take three points uh, that you, you normalize, a triangle that you normalize, and everything is scaled to that. So you're finished. The whole problem is, is solved, uh, obviously. Now, it shows several things. And the reason I chose that example is, is the following. How would I actually solve this problem of if I know the local model of the data, which is I know the local configuration, I can actually, by trigonometry, figure out what the local map is, how do I actually get the global map? Okay, the way you do it is by integration. So in other words, you take a piece, a piece of that puzzle, and you look at the neighboring pieces, and you match them, and keep on building the puzzle until you got the whole map. Okay, when you do that, starting at a point, and you do it, you risk actually making mistakes along the way and finding uh, Denver and San Francisco close to each other. Okay, so so the point is, but it's a process of integration. And in fact, <coughs> this allows you very simply. This extends the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I know the difference of the values of two functions at two neighboring points, and I know even the absolute value of the distance between two neighbors and maybe one neighbor beyond, it's easy to reconstruct the function through this eigenvector, which is solving the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And you can solve many other equations that way. But there is another point in there. How do you actually solve, find the eigenvectors of, of a matrix? You start with a random vector, you apply the matrix, you read, normalize, apply the matrix, normalize, apply the matrix, normalize. If the random vector were a point, and you sort of propagate your knowledge from that point further out and further out and further out, you are integrating. But you could start points scattered randomly around and do this integration process from all directions at once. So it's actually more robust, and pro finding the eigenvector is, is also more stable than doing the sort of local incremental uh, informational assessment, if you wish. So the, the general process of sort of linking and understanding coordinates on sets of points. So again, come, let's come back to my example that I had before. The example of this molecule, so I had, say, millions of uh, sort of the different states of the molecule that I have generated by machine or I measured. Uh, whichever it is, and I want to find out the, the manifold of those two angles in there. So how would I do that? The way to do it is to get the invariant coordinates. Since I want it to be also independent of the modality of measurements, I want the invariant coordinates. So the simplest way is to, again, try to estimate the probability that two points x and y are in the same state. So you can measure that probability very simply by, say, looking at the cloud of points around x, a cloud of points around y, doing some statistics on the two clouds. In other words, uh, I can do some, build some histograms around x, a histogram around y, and now I need to have some metric which measure, measures their distances, and I'll return to that a little bit later. How do you match cloud of points? And you can t define a kernel, which is basically PXY, essentially representing the, the sort of conditional probability or conditional correlations between the cloud at X and the cloud at Y, or the state of X and the state of Y. I, this, this is a one thing here which is open to discussion. <laughs> and if you want, we can do it uh, offline. So this kernel. Because it is probability, it, it really, so what does it do for you? It basically represents essentially the constraints. If you think of the kernel as some sort of <coughs> uh, 
correlation or covariance between x and y in some high dimensional space, it sort of represents a local model relating the, the, the points to each other. Okay, so it's like what we did with a tensor, with a uh, localiz tensor localization system uh, where we had a local model, it represents that sort of local model. So once you've done that, you have this kernel, PXY. So again, you can think of X and Y as discrete, discrete ma massive discrete matrix. So in the case of a million samples of this vibrational molecule, I could take a million by million matrix. There's no need to do that, but you could. And then take that matrix and just diagonalize it, okay? The eigenvectors of that matrix, okay, are basically functions of x, okay? Being functions of x, they are, uh, they are variables that I can use to describe the position of x. So this is sort of the eigenvector embedding of my data into some high dimensional space. I can decide I want only to look at 50 or 100 eigenvectors if that's sufficient for my needs. By the way, the number of eigenvectors you need is at least as big as the number of constituents or, or clusters, if you wish, in the data or different states of the data. If, if this molecule here, uh, if I run my experiment and I find that there are maybe 100,000 different states that I cannot <laughs> match to each other, uh, that's how many eigenvectors I would need. There's nothing I can do about it. Nature is what it is. So this embedding is really an embedding which should be viewed as an embedding in Hilbert space, just like uh, the, the embedding of Riemannian manifold by associating to a point a diffusion, a, a, a heat kernel. And here I'm associating not to a point a heat kernel, but to two points. The, the probability that they're, they're in the same states. In the case of a Riemannian manifold, whatever this probability is, it's going to be some function of the geodesic distance between the points, because uh, if, if I'm look, basing it on, uh, on, on heat. So, so the eigenvectors of that are not automatically going to be eigenvectors of, of the laplace beltrami operator of the manifold. And so it, it basically tells us something, and I, I will return to the uh, Laplace Beltrami in a minute, but it tells us I can use the eigenvectors of any manifold, the sort of intrinsic coordinates to use if I wanted to build atlases, if I wanted to analyze data, whatever, whatever it is. And the, the point I, I, I want to make is that you don't want to restrict, if the manifold could be dimension two, like it was in the molecule, but it could also be dimension uh, D, and you still may need to have a very, very large number of uh, eigenvectors to get good coordinates. Think of the manifold as like a, a collection of grapes uh, which are linked to each other. And every grape has its, own, <laughs> has its own coordinates, right? You can't do anything about it. So here, coming back to the manifold, there is a, a, a theorem proved by uh, Peter Jones, uh, Mauro Maggioni, and Ranan Schul, uh, not long ago, uh, after we started this, this adventure, that in fact, if you take a Riemannian manifold and you want to construct uh, a coordinate system around the point, then you can always find eigenvectors of the Laplace Beltrami operator that give you, sort of in some ways, an optimal description of the coordinates around the point. Uh, and so they map, they, they, they take a patch which is maximal. They, they, you can choose them so that they will map, map a maximal patch into uh, d-dimensional Euclidean space. And depending on the point, you will take a different set of eigenvectors. So they're sort of a universal library of uh, functions that you can use to build any atlas you want of the, of, of the manifold. And of course, because they are eigenvectors of something which is intrinsic, I mean, they don't care about where you saw the manifold. The manifold could have been uh, some sort of very uh, embedding in high dimension, low dimension, it doesn't really matter, as long as, uh, as, long as the notion of neighborhood in whatever, whatever version you have is the same. So you need for every point to know who the neighbors are at the point who are a distance epsilon from the point. 
I mean, Riemannian distance epsilon from the point. If you have that, you have the metric. You also have an operator which is averaging on that cloud of points. And the eigenvectors of that are the eigenvectors of that. They don't care. You have intrinsically defined everything. And you got this collection of functions. So here, let me show you how you apply that. Okay. So this is a process which is about maybe five or ten lines of MATLAB, okay, without knowing anything about anything. So what it does is this. You have this image here. And I pick a pixel. I don't know if you, okay, you see my, my pointer on the scarf here. And for that pixel, okay, that's, that's my point of interest. Now, I want to organize a, a manifold on that picture. What would the manifold be? I can take for every pixel, I can take the 5 by 5 patch around the pixel. That's a vector in 25 dimensions. I mean, the, the, with gray level, which is, each coordinate is a gray level of the corresponding 25 pixels. And now I, I decide that, uh, so, in this case, I, I just pretend that the right probability is that pixel P is going to be uh, of, the same, of the same kind as pixel Q is just e to the minus the distance between the two patches scaled appropriately. So when I do that, what happens is that I, I can now, uh, so I have an operator, which means what is the operator? I take a point, I take a function on this, on this uh, image, of you wish, a function is, another, is a function of p, and then I average it on all pixels which are uh, neighbors of p. So this is like the averaging on the neighborhood of the pixel p. And the eigenvectors of that, uh, I collect the first uh, 50 of them. But then I do something much more interesting. I could go back to what I have here which is I would like to find which eigenvectors for a given pixel give me a good description of the neighborhood of that pixel, okay? So returning here, that's exactly what I did. So I found that the eigenvector 5, 8, and 10 are the ones which are the most active at that particular location which I uh, indicated here. And those eigenvectors, uh, well, there are three functions, so there are three images. Because there are three images, I could represent, it, represent them in red, green, and blue. And, and then I have this image underneath. And the neighbors of this pixel here is all everything that you see here, mostly the eigenvectors that really counts is the green one. And you can see them here. So all I've done is translated this geometry that we have here, right? to the geometry that we have here. And that's nothing. That's beautiful processing. And if you wish, it's a processing in which I connect the dots, right? I'm doing the same integration I described before for the, uh, for the sensor localization, which is I'm saying I'm going to connect each pixel to the neighboring pixels because the patches around them are more or less the same. And I'm going to track those sub-images in the, in the picture, tracking those sub-images, uh, I will find the region corresponding to that particular location which was of interest. I will uh, show you later that we are going to do things like this to track the activity in the brain of a mouse, and it's much more interesting. So the question, <coughs> there is a question which is fundamental in all of that, which is what is a good way of matching two subsets of points in Rn. So for example, I could have those two curves, and I want to measure a distance between them. So we have heard here, and we will hear again and again and again, that a good way of measuring the distance between two probability distributions, or which this is, I can view this, each one of those curves as being a, a a density and normalize it to have density one, and then how do I measure the distance between those two densities? Uh, there, there's always there's something called transportation distance or earth mover distance, which says I'm going to, to take points on one curve, 
trying to find a map to the other curve and then uh, pay the price of how much I moved the point around and then try to, among all possible maps, minimize the total amount of work I have to do to go from one curve to the next. So, so that's very nice, but not necessarily very easy to compute. There's a much simpler way, uh, which is uh, to do this, which should just take the curve, make it fat, now they look much closer to each other, and make it fatter, now they look identical. At every scale, I want to measure the distance between the, the fattened curve with a weight which goes up with the scale. So in other words, when the scale is large, everything is the same. I have to sort of compensate for that by multiplying by a large number. And when it's, uh, when, uh, it's low, I, I don't want to use that. Here the distance is two, right? Uh, they, basically, they have nothing in common. So the issue is that one needs to have to, to do that. When you do that, and so by the way, this earth mover distance can be computed uh, if the, the penalty that you're taking as Euclidean distance to some power less than one can easily be computed by just doing exactly what I did, just average and compare, uh, compare different scales. This is a equivalent to some Bessoff norm on the distribution defined by the, by the points viewed as a dual of function which are Lipschitz or something, uh, not Lipschitz, holder. And then you can use wavelets, so you can do it all kinds of ways. You, you, this is sort of relatively easy exercise, very fast to compute. But the point of that, it allows you to organize families of curves. So when do you get families of curves? You get them, for example, when you have a dynamical system. So uh, here, uh, uh, this is uh, the standard map on the torus, which is defined by those equations up there. Uh, it has a lot of orbits. The orbit space is described as, as this color image. And the issue is, what is the structure of the orbit space? So for the topologist among you, uh, it, it's clearly nice. You would like to understand that. Not only that, but uh, there is a parameter alpha floating in there. And you want to organize not just a single orbit, but the family of all dynamical system as a family depending on the parameter alpha. So, you, for, so every dynamical system is basically described by this collection. For each alpha, you have this image on the right. But then as alpha moves from, say, 0 to 1, you have a whole movie. And you want to understand the structure of all of that, right? And so you, you can do that by, again, uh, uh, building a, a, joint, a joint graph. I'll, I'll come back to that. We'll do more, a slightly more interesting thing. OK, so another aspect of this geometry of points in Rn is that when n is small, it's not so interesting for an analyst. OK, when n is large, uh, it becomes much, much more interesting. And you can think of it as looking of the f at the following situation. You have some, tr let's say I have a, a, a a large collection of points, uh, let's say the, the cloud of stars in the universe, or just inside a galaxy, and there's gravitational interaction between them. And so basically, for every pair of points, you have the, poten the gravitational potential which uh, relates their relationship in, 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 this, in this universe, right? So the data that one has here is basically a, a lo very large matrix, which is a matrix of all stars that you have measured. And the basically the matrix of one of the distance between them, between any pair, right? So for every star, you have the interaction of that star with all the others. So every point, if it interacts, assume that it interacts with another 1,000 points and everything else is sort of negligible, you have for every point, you have a 1,000 points. Uh, in which it interacts, this matrix, but still, if you have a million points, you have a million by million matrix. So your data is a million points. Each one interacts with another set of million uh, points. And what you want to do is organize, uh, organize them uh, in a way which, where all the dependencies are sort of washed out. Okay? Uh, 
So this is done in numerical analysis. Of course, you cannot do anything on a million squared matrix, or at least you couldn't. And so there were methods like the fast multiple methods uh, introduced by Rocklin, but even going further down, the Calderon-Zygmunt decompositions introduced by, by Calderon and Zygmunt, in which what you do is basically organize, organize the points into a hierarchical collection of, of boxes and organize the, so you, you organize the columns of this kernel and the rows of that kernel into two different organizations, depending if they are, if it's the same space, it's more or less the same organization, but it could not, did, not, did not be. More complicated than that, you could have, you could try and do the acoustics in this orchestra hall, or in this no, no hall, okay, and it doesn't matter what, what you do, unless you organize all the points where you want to, you say you want to, to have the best possible acoustic at every location, and you have all the reflections coming from everywhere, so you have all the people here are the sort of the receiver, and all the sources are the various points where the sound is reflected from. And so you want to relate one to the other and organize this universe, okay. At this point, uh, at least to my knowledge, no machine learning will do anything. Okay. It's way too complicated, uh, both in terms of how many measurements and how much variability there is in there. You really have to organize that, this universe. So that's what I'm, go I'm going to describe how to do it. So the way we want to think about it is like a big monster questionnaire, okay, in which every person in this room is basically constantly uh, assessing the quality of the sound, if you wish, and, and then there is a various location which generate it. Anyway, let's go back to this example I had before with the Cauchy transform, which I measured. So you have this curve, and let's say that P of S represents a point on the curve uh, parameterized by arc length S. The function 1 over P of S minus Z is a function on the curve. So you have a curve, you have all the points on the curve, and you have this collection of functions on the curve. So when you have, uh, say you have a questionnaire, and I'll show you uh, in a few minutes maybe a, a psychological questionnaire you have people, you have 500 questions, every question is a function on the people, okay, and every person is a function on the, on the, is a function on the questions, right? The responses are a function, uh, are the, and that. Now, what I want to do is show you that you can organize the geometry of the questions and the geometry of the, of the people in that case in such a way that all the redundancies or more, many of the redundancies and dependencies are sort of washed out and you try to represent it in a, in a much simpler way. Okay? Uh, that's one of the goals. The other goal is to actually process all possible information that I may be interested by in the future after I've organized the geometry of my data. So in the case of a, of a database, which is a questionnaire, people being asked questions, and you have responses of thousands of people uh, to hundreds of questions, and you want to organ get an atlas of psychological responses, you, you want to do it so that you can actually use that to compute functions that you haven't asked about, like, for example, how dysfunctional is that particular person, okay, or how effective he is, okay, or so on. So, so in the case of the Cauchy transform, the functions we were looking at are basically the function, the holomorphic function on the curve, which have a pole, I mean, the simple rational functions having a pole at Z, right? That was it. Z is off the curve. That's my collection of functions, and I organize the geometry based on that collection. Okay? So I can organize the geometry of the Zs, which are the various locations. That gives me something like a Whitney decomposition of the upper half space or the space next to the curve, and then a geometry of, the, of S, which is the usual geometry on the line uh, that one has. So I think I'm running out of time, but basically the process is, I, I'm going to skip a lot. So the process is you have some sort of organized matrix, which is a ground truth that has been permuted around, and you want to be able to, to recover it. 
Uh, here, I've done the same. I take, took this image, and I basically converted every pixel to plus, plus one, zero, uh, between, uh, zero or one by tossing a coin with probability, uh, which is a gray level of the image. I get what's, uh, what's up here, and I uh, need to restore the original image. So that's sort of the generic problem. You can do, you can do quite, uh, quite well in doing it. A, a more interesting example is what I said. You have this 3,000 people, 500 questions, answering yes or no to the questions. And that's gar it looks like the, the, the garbage picture on, on the top left. And the issue is, what do you do with it? Okay. And the point is, you can get it organized into groups of people which have, will have similar response, response which is uh, uh, what I was describing before, say, are two people likely to be in the same psychological state based on their answer? That would be my, my kernel, and I can use that to organize the people into groups. I can also organize the questions by, are two questions relating to the same, or basically asking the same thing, and by just seeing across the population how similar the responses are. So I also have an organization of the rows of this matrix. And the, the joint organization is one you, where you want to have this, a simple possible structure, uh, the simplest possible structure on, you see the highlighted box here, shows you that in that group of columns and that group of rows, basically the response is a barcode. Okay? Everybody in the group uh, get the same no answer from that group of questions, and everybody gets the same uh, thing. So this geometry can be uh, extracted from the uh, sort of initial thing by iteration. The main point here is that none of that works if you ignore the facts of life, which is that many questions are equivalent to each other. They're basically asking the same thing. People tend to get tired of answering 570 questions, and they sometimes put anything down. So if I compare the response of a person to the response of another person, I may have a lot of responses which are basically noisy, misfits, and it's not very accurate. I should do much better. I should compare the response to a certain conceptual group of questions to the response for another person to a conceptual group of questions. And that will basically give rise to an earth mover distance between people profile. Similarly, once I've organized the people in certain categories, then I get a response of how I, I, get, to, I get the understanding of whether questions are related to each other. In other words, I see to those two questions, the same groups, uh, certain groups of people or all groups of people answer the same way, so they must be related. Okay, so I, the issue here is to eliminate the dependencies between them. So when you do that on the psychological questionnaire, you get a, a beautiful manifold uh, describing the people. And uh, the people who are uh, the blue highlighted people here are completely dysfunctional, as verified by, by the, the graph on top is something that came from uh, the psychologist who basically said, well, let's say the second one is depression level, I don't know what the others are, but zero is a mean, and it's in standard, units of standard deviation for various psychological conditions. So you see that everybody, and, and being up is, is bad. So everybody in the blue group is, is in, in trouble. On the other hand, the other extremity, uh, everybody is incredibly stable and functional and so on. And again, uh, what I'm really trying to, what I'm, my, my message here is that this nice two-dimensional geography of people came about, it's, it's not real, okay? It's really something that one imposes on the data. In other words, if I were to actually organize the people by similarity of, of profiles, I'll just get something that looks like a Gaussian cloud. Okay, the reason they're so well organized is that I'm, imp I'm defining a similarity of people between people which is rather, rather uh, smooth in the sense that I compare them by responses to large groups of questions. Suppose I split the question into bad questions and good questions, 
And then I, I just would to do ask basically classify a person by the proportion of bad questions he answered yes to. Okay. Then I'll have a one parameter curve. So this two dimensional manifold will look like a curve. And that's it. The way I'm setting it up, I'm basically doing signal processing on the data by, by imposing how, similar, how to measure the similarity between clouds. So my, again, my point is that it's very nice to let mathematics dictate, but it's also not related to anything sometimes. Okay? You have to, you let mathematics dictate, but you have to understand what, how it imposes, how it changes the metric space that you are dealing with, what it discriminates among, and, and what, it, what kind of discrimination it provides, or, or similarity it provides. I'm at the end of my talk. Let me just skip this. Let me just say this. Uh, this is interesting for the people here who do spectral theory. Uh, if you take your Riemannian manifold and basically take the eigenvectors of Laplacian on that manifold, and then you say, well, let's look at this as a questionnaire. Every eigenvector at every point has a certain value. I'm looking at the collection of eigenvectors as the responses to questions that the point is asking. So my situation is I have points, I have questions. Eigenvectors are answers. How do I organize? What is the geometry of eigenvectors? Okay. I have a Riemannian geometry on the manifold. How do I build the corresponding dual geometry on, the, on, on that? And so if you deal with them like a psychological questionnaire, it works extremely well. So for example, take the function sine kx, which are the eigenvectors of uh, second derivative uh, on, on 0, 1. Uh, you organize them, and then you, you see that you can get an organization with a little bit of cheating. You can get an organization of both k and x. x is, the cheating is that you're assuming you, have, you, you sort of have a little bit more x's. You know, eigenvectors are orthogonal. So you can't tell anything. But if you sample twice in x, you can organize the x variable. And that organizes everything else. So you need a lever to start with. OK. The point, let me just one, OK, this is good. You see that? We wanted to understand the brain of a mouse. <laughs> so this is a pendulum with a constant changing over time. OK. And we took a video camera of that, took a video image of this pendulum, and then projected it into, I think we have 100 dimensions. We took 100 run, is displayed as an image. And you can barely see it. There is sort of, can, can you run the? I don't know. When you run it, the, 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 the different pixels here fluctuate completely randomly. So the question was, can we derive from that the actual normal modes? So at every, at every time the spring is constant, so they're natural frequencies. And so that's, again, exactly what you get by doing the process I've described before. You can actually get the, the physical normal mode by finding the intrinsic variable of that, of that system. You see here the spring constant is changing all the time. And I'm going to, to finish with those pictures. So this was a model for what you get here. So here's a picture is, is this. You have this mouse who is basically going to go and grab some food and eat it. And you image the neuronal fluctuation in the window in his motor co cortex. So what you get is this is just a snapshot on the left of the raw data that you get. On the right, you get the underlying geometry of the neurons in there. It looks like sort of vegetation patch underwater. And the corresponding uh, cleaned activity. But here is where the challenge comes in. When he does the same thing again, at the same time, you get a different dynamic picture. So the issue is, how does one compare sort of neuronal patterns, or if you wish, weather patterns of activity in a way that's informative relative to the state of mind of the, of the mouse at this given time. Is it disappointed, happy, excited, or just ready to go to sleep, right? And so, again, we do the same thing, but everything I said is, can be done in that, except that it's three-dimensional in the sense that 
We are running 100 experiments. Each experiment is one video on 100 frames, and there's, say, 100 different uh, neuronal groups in there. And so you analyze each one of the axes. It's a three-dimensional questionnaire, right? You're asking every neuron what it did at a given time on a given experiment, and every experiment what the different neurons were doing uh, through all times in that experiment, and so on. And so the point is that you can extract the underlying physical model empirically. I'm not saying it explains anything, but at least you have some sort of guarantee that you have a description that you may be able to trust to actually do the, do the science behind it. Okay. So this is introduction to science. So, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this, this wonderful talk. Uh, as you know, it's not really very feasible in this room to have questions asked from the uh, audience and then answered by the speaker to the whole uh, uh, public. But uh, uh, Professor Korfman is uh, happy to uh, uh, answer questions uh, in, 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 uh, to people who would come up during the intermission. So uh, I would welcome, I, I, I would encourage you to do that. We have had an overview where it's clear that we, only, we get a glimpse of a lot more and there is a lot uh, that is really intriguing and very interesting here. So let's thank the speaker again and And that closes this session.